So we're starting back on Peter Paul Rubens, and below I've got a bit of information posted about him, but not as much as the other three. Uh, he didn't have a special made about him because his life was mostly smooth sailing. There weren't but a couple of instances where he really had to struggle for anything. He was he was born extremely wealthy, married into an even more wealthy family. He was good at everything that he did. You know, couldn't have had a more fortunate life. Uh, that doesn't mean that he wasn't still a really good painter, though. Um, he is acknowledged by some, and I believe I have this listed below, uh, as one of the greatest technical painters of the 17th century, which is really high esteem considering how much talent he was paired with. Uh, even in just the, the Dutch Republic, a lot of people had this argument about whether or not Rembrandt or Rubens uh, was the dominant painter of that generation, but it's really just a matter. They were two totally different types of painter, so I don't know that that's a really fair comparison. I will say that this is probably uh, the most impressive altarpiece that I think I, that I can think of from the 17th century period. Um, it is probably also the best ascension scene that, I, that I've ever seen. Um, an ascension scene is one where the uh, Christ has been nailed to the cross and it's being raised. It's in the process of being raised. Um, the thing that I like about this is that there's so much energy. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that there are so many diagonal lines that are breaking up this composition. Diagonal lines introduce a sense of energy and movement because it really, in nature, nothing really stays out of diagonal very long. It's usually in the process of either being raised or falling, uh, which inherently gives us a sense of, of, of motion. Um, there are a ton of people here. Um, it's it's like a, a chaos of humanity, which I theme, think uh, accurately reflects the attitude of what's supposed to be happening here. Uh, it's also really impressive that he was able to have so many different people sort of filling out this really broad narrative uh, in a lot of different ways. Um, even down here, let me zoom in on that. A lot of times people have they have questions about why this woman is breastfeeding at a crucifixion. Um, that is actually a reference to uh, charity, to feeding the poor, uh, making sure that everyone who needs help gets help. Um, it's just a uh, it's a very common thing. You actually see a lot of a lot of reference to this, but instead of babies, they have really elderly men. Um, there's a biblical reference that's being made there, uh, but it's kind of a long story. Um, just know that that's what that means. But just look at the the color, the musculature that's being represented here. I uh, say that uh, Peter Paul Rubens had the intensity of color as Titian, but he had the ability to render the figure like Michelangelo, which are also those are two pretty high compliments. Um, but yeah, you you do see here. There's a lot of dynamism here. Uh, really intense color, uh, which is something a lot of his work actually suffers with. Um, this. It's actually evidence of one of the, the few uh, struggles in his life in that um, he was hired to commemorate um, every year of the life of Maria de' Medici, which was this generation's matriarch of the Medici family. Um, and she ended up running out of money, and she wasn't able to uh, go through with the commission, despite the fact that he'd already spent about a decade coming up with at least 10 paintings as part of the series before uh, he was informed that she wouldn't be able to fulfill her commission. Uh, but you can see here that there's a lot of color here, uh, but it just seems a little bit more muted. And I don't know if that's because of the, the varnish that's been applied over the paint or, uh, if, or if it is the way that he you know, mixed color. But the intensity that you have here isn't quite as pronounced as here. Anyway, um, there's going to be some discussion about this in the material that's posted later. Uh, there's another hour-long documentary, The Power of Art, Rembrandt, which details a lot of his life. He was a very different figure than either Bernini or Caravaggio. Uh, Bernini and Caravaggio, were, they were superstars who really, one way or another, really filled out that role. Um, Rembrandt was more of a regular person who, who had some bad habits. One of, one of those is that he just couldn't hold on to his money which is why at various points in time he was absolutely bankrupt and destitute. That's really at one of the points where the uh, Power of Art documentary starts out. But the reason I stopped on this particular image is because this is an etching. It's an etching in, in a very similar fashion to 
Uh, what we were seeing in the last module with um, both Martin Schongauer, the, the, the German printmaker, and with uh, Albert Durer, the, also a German printmaker, um, with his Adam and Eve, um, the difference here is that Rembrandt is still working that same dramatic sense of tenebrism that's become so characteristic of the 17th century into something that that really relies entirely on value you know this the printmaking process doesn't give you the uh the uh, luxury of color at least not at, not at this point but um he's still got this really intense spotlighting effect um uh, it's casting a strong focus on the christ figure here in the middle um you're catching a lot of light on this side but it's so much light that you're losing a lot of the contrast here but he just does a really great job focusing attention here and still keeping those really deep shadows along the edge, which just frames that whole composition. It's just really impressive work. This is also really interesting. I'll talk about this uh, in the information below, too. Um, he's really known today for his self-portraits, um, which is, serves a pretty accurate documentation of where he was at in his life. You know, every couple of years he would do uh, at least one self-portrait. I don't know if he was doing it specifically for posterity. A lot of a lot of art historians theorize that he was just one of those people that couldn't stop working. And if he didn't have a commission to be working on, then he would just make a painting of himself. But you can really see how the years wear on him and all the, the psychological strain of his just having to be him and live his life. Watch the documentary. He explains a lot of stuff. Jan Vermeer is, a, it is an extremely extremely uh, thorough, meticulous, um, talented painter who we're just not going to take a whole lot of time to discuss. He's one of those painters that doesn't get a lot of attention today, but I feel like within the next 50 or 60 years, as he begins to enter more discussions about 17th century artwork, uh, the level of detail that he puts into his subject matter and the amount of focus that he creates through compositional skill, through things like directional forces and contrast of color, uh, it's something that there are other really, really talented artists who focus on composition during the 17th century, but Jan Vermeer really is head and shoulders above everyone else. Uh, unfortunately, we just don't have a lot of time to talk about him today. So there's Louis XIV, the Louis XIV, the Sun King. Uh, he was for 75 years uh, the single and superior ruler of all of the French Empire, and he led, led it with an iron fist. Um, he was a man who did not accept compromise. He was absolutely emblematic of the 17th century from a political perspective. Uh, he made absolutely no compromises and, and considered himself the embodiment of the French Empire. He was France. He was also a uh, self-trained uh, balleroni, which I believe is the male term for ballerina, which is why he's wearing these high heels. That's exactly what those are. He was actually very proud of the shape of his legs, so he would show them off as accurately as possible. Now, this is a royal portrait, but this specific royal portrait was actually painted um, as a gift for, uh, for, for Louis' own grandson. Like, could you imagine getting a portrait of your grandfather just showing this much leg? So that's a sassy man right there. He's also got that puffy hair because he was kind of short and a little bit insecure about it. So he'd puff his hair up to make him look as tall as possible, which might also have something to do with those high heels. But everything that he surrounds himself with this image suggests his ultimate authority over everything that is France. And that includes uh, all the luxuries and, and spoils that come along with being king and the military responsibilities. But he's a very, very intense guy. Um, just an extremely interesting man. Not the most upstanding moral person, but a very interesting man. Uh, and this was his house, Versailles. Versailles is probably the most impressive, most opulent of all of the royal French chateaus. I've got a whole folder at the bottom of this uh, module uh, that had, just has some, some photographs and a little bit of information about the French chateaus, but um, France is, was never hurting for Chateau, <coughs> excuse me, um, I think Chateau is French for castle, um, so there are Chateaus all over France, but 29, or all over France, but 29 of them specifically belong to the king himself, um, I can't imagine being the person that, you know, well, the King Louis, 
Um, originally, uh, Versailles was a hunting chateau. It was a much, much smaller building uh, in the middle of a hunting ground. And at some point, um, he decided that 28 massively impressive chateaus weren't enough. So he decided to tear the hunting lodge down, the original chateau, and replace it with what is an absolutely massive structure in an even more in, impressive garden. Um, the gardens at Versailles, um, I'll put it to you this way. I was there, I went. I actually had the, the, the great benefit of being able to, to go to France this past summer. I don't know if I've mentioned that yet. But um, I went to Versailles and I was going to make a point to see the entire garden. And I was there for four hours and there were still parts of it that I didn't get to. And I wasn't walking slow either. It is just it is a massive garden that is arranged almost like a hedge maze. Um, and the hedges at this point are about 20 to 25 feet tall. So it is, it's very dense and makes you feel very isolated at times, which is kind of nice considering that you're in this otherwise a bit like just expansive open space. But just everything about Versailles is was the absolute height of opulence in its day which really made louis at different points in time extremely unpopular amongst the french people uh if you have a 75 year career there are different points in time where people are going to hate you as a political leader um spending almost the entirety of the french treasury on one more royal chateau did not endear him to the french people overall now this is a perfect example as to why the hall of mirrors this is where you would have your biggest parties. This is where you would invite your, your emissaries to meet. This is where you would really, really demonstrate your wealth. And one of the biggest demonstrations of wealth that you have here is this wall of 18 foot tall mirrors. I believe it's 18 feet. Mirrors at the time would have been more expensive than, than gold or really anything else that you could manage. The, the process was extremely meticulous and time consuming. So these mirrors were just as much a display of wealth as the chandeliers or the sculptures or any other element of, of what you see here. Now the next two paintings, this one and this one, not working with me, there you go, are perfect examples of what's referred to as Rococo. Rococo was a different style that initiated at the very end of the 17th century and carried on into the 18th century. That was kind of a response to uh the baroque movement things just they kind of they tend to go back and forth um for a while you have let's say the roman empire where interests are uh, largely secular uh paganism does have a preference but the religiosity of the artwork doesn't necessarily dominate it and then you have the middle ages where the holy roman empire becomes the ultimate authority the Renaissance is a response to that, where people begin to look for ways to sort of edge their way out of the authority of the church. And by the time we get to the 17th century, you have a lot of people that are establishing the authority of the church, but it, for the most part, the populace um, is still looking for and commissioning uh, spiritual artwork. The Rococo is largely void of spirituality, but it is full of very sweet, pretty things. You know, the Baroque is very dramatic. It's very heavy. It's extremely intense. It's full of things like crucifixions and uh, beheadings and really, really incredible things. Rococo stylistically does share similar elements, uh, but it's much calmer. It's just meant to decorate a wall. It's meant to be pretty. It's meant to to be really happy and enjoyable, which as much as I don't really like Rococo, I can't blame the population of people who just spent, you know, an entire century being bombarded by beheadings, you know, can't blame them too much. Uh, there are a few characteristics that you'll find in most Rococo images. Uh, it's usually there's um, a, a couple, usually it's a young couple, it's a little older, hard to tell, but it's at least one couple, in this case many, um, in the next one you'll see more characteristic two couples in a semi-public semi-private place there will be evidence of greek or roman culture which is usually usually in some form of sculpture and it usually takes place in a semi-public semi-private place like for example this this little sculpture garden or whatever this is young lovers uh classical culture semi-public semi-private place that's rococo 
a neutered version of Baroque.